wanting to talk to me today. We are, feel very privileged. I know you have a, only a short time here, uh, so I'm going to just let you take it away uh, okay. and, and pick uh, some questions that you would like to answer. That sounds great. Um, I'd like to start with Book Johnson, please. actually quite an athlete in my youth. Um, in the Netherlands it gets quite snowy and uh, I was a really good ice skater so I quite enjoyed um, skating and skiing uh, and I like I liked going to the beach with my family um, and I was just turning into a teenager when I went into hiding so I was starting to kind of go out with my friends on my own go to the movies and that sort of thing, but um, before they were restricted to Jewish people. Um, I really liked reading and I really liked writing, so those are probably the two things I was able to keep doing once we went into the annex. Um, did that answer your question, Um Taylor Gregory? Um, before we moved to the annex. Um, the worst experiences, it's kind of hard to describe and I think it might be really hard to understand. Um, but, you know, my family moved from Germany to uh, the Netherlands to try and get away from the Nazis originally. Did you guys know that? Probably, yeah. Um, so, my father tells me when I was too young, we moved when I was four, and he said that he could remember even then, even that early of days, um, that there was a stormtrooper song that they would sing when they would go marching by that said, when Jewish blood splatters from the night. And it sounds pretty ominous and pretty um, foreboding now, um, but people just didn't believe how bad it was going to get at the time. So I think... Have you ever heard that story of if you cook a frog and you try and put it in a boiling pot of water, it jumps out? But if you put it in cold water and you slowly heat the water up, the frog doesn't realize what's happening until it's too late? I think it was a little bit like that for people in occupied the Netherlands and in Germany, especially for Jews at first, anyway. Um, so I suppose they were all little infringements on our rights that ebbed away very slowly. First, what we had to do was register, and then the city officials had to give a map of where all the Jewish people lived. And then, okay, now we couldn't go to our school anymore. We had to go to a segregated school. Um, and that seemed crappy until then we weren't allowed to ride bikes. 
and then we were forbidden to write public transport. Um, so I suppose a little right the way it writes that happened leading up to us going into hiding. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, I know this is sim a similar question. Um, Lauren Williams. Well, um, you guys are around and age a little older, is that right? You're old. You're about how old I was when I went into hiding. You're about fourteen or fifteen. Okay. So the things that bothered me the most of the time were uh, social social things. So all of a sudden we couldn't go to the movies. We couldn't go to get our hair done. We couldn't go to sit in our own gardens after 8 p.m. or leave our house after 8 p.m. Um, we couldn't go to the movies. We couldn't do any sports. We couldn't ride bikes. Um, and uh, my father wasn't allowed to own his business anymore. Um, but the stuff that bothered me the most was just not being able to be around my friends. We couldn't visit Christians. So um, that, that really bothered me a great deal. Um, and how do we deal with it? We would just get around it. We would go for a walk or visit one another before the curfew um, and just try and make the best we could of the bad situation. Um, Holly Johnson? I think that's a really deep question, Molly. Um, look, I think, yes, I did sometimes, but not the way that you might think. Not because I wished deep down that I wasn't Jewish, but more the way that you might wish for straight hair if you have curly hair or blonde hair if you have dark hair. And I never really thought of it as something that I could actually remove myself from or change my mind about. Um, it's, it's just a part of me, and I would know from reading my diary that, and even though I worried and thought a lot about myself, I never ever hated myself. You know, and hating being Jewish would be like hating me in a way. Yeah. Um, Keely Bambridge. Um, yes, uh, I wanted to be, uh, in my fantasy world, I really wanted to be a professional ice skater. I really um, looked up to this lady named Sonia Henney, who was an amazing ice skater at the time. And I had all these photographs up on my wall. Um, and I did seven like, performances on ice skates. But, um, if I wasn't going to be that, I was going to be a journalist or maybe a writer. And I wanted to travel, really, was interested in traveling and seeing the world. And I hoped that I was going to be able to study abroad. And even when I went into the annex, I still studied languages and learned how to speak English and read English. Um, um, Maya McDonald? Constructed avatar. She's not here right now. <laughs> if you could have changed one thing about the annex, what would it have been and why? Yes. Uh, I think the thing that I longed for more than anything in the world was just to be able to have the opportunity to go outside. I just miss being outside. It wasn't even safe to look out the window. Um, but sometimes I would sneak out with binoculars and look out into the window and look at the world around and sometimes I can lay at night and look up at the stars and I just felt free for a few moments. Even when we were going on the train to see the work camps, just looking out the window and seeing the world going by and seeing outside again, it was a little bit like freedom, even though I knew it was going to end in more captivity. So one thing I would definitely change was even if I just had a little 
place to be outdoors. But it made a big difference. Um, yeah. Um, uh, Elizabeth Day. I did write um, quite a few of my stories down, some fiction and non-fiction stories, um, and I'm pleased to say that they were published in uh, 1947 in a book called, a series called Tales from the Sacred Annex, which is a collection of sort of some of my fiction and my non-fiction writing, um, so that's pretty amazing. As a person who only lived till I was 16 when I have two published books. Yeah. Um, um, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, Mariah, Mariah Clark? Clark? Did you ever regret going into hiding at the Secret I, um, with the kind of little, when I first started, I didn't understand how bad it was going to be. And I actually don't think I realized how long we're going to have to wait it out. I think when you're young, you don't realize how long wars last. So, so I didn't really, in my imagination, think we were going to be there for two years. And, and I felt a lot of guilt about the, the people I left behind. I had friends, both Jewish friends and Christian friends, but some of my Jewish friends, I never knew what happened to them. And I felt kind of guilty, as you probably would, if you left some of your best friends behind. And they were maybe going to be taken away to work camps. You have this kind of survivor guilt. Um, but, but as, as far as being safe with my family, family it was a good, a good, good idea. idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Shay? Shay? Do you think you would have gotten together with Peter if you had not been hiding together? That's a really, really good question. question. What, do what do you think, think Shay? Shay? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. I, I thought it was pretty... pretty he, he guy when I first met him, to be honest. And uh, I was reasonably popular at school before I got locked in an annex. I wouldn't say it was as far as, you know, not if you were the last boy on earth. I don't think it was that bad, but look, I thought he was pretty goofy when I first met him. And he was really shy and sort of hung around with his cat all the time. And, and he had that really overbearing mother. And, and so, so yeah, yeah, probably, probably if, if we weren't stuck, stuck together in circumstances, I, we, we probably would not have hooked up, I don't think. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Sarah, Sarah Jordan, Jordan. Similar, similar question, I think. Do you think you and Peter may have stayed together if you both survived the first um, So, I think that's a deep question, question in one sense, because, because I think... Really? really? I don't even know if we would have stayed together if we weren't caught by the Nazis. Because towards the end, it was kind of annoying. It was kind of weak. You know? And so I was like kind of a bit bored with him towards the end anyway. It was my first kiss. So. But I don't know. I was kind of wearing clothes on him anyway. But at the same time, that experience, you know, when you have a shared trauma with somebody together, like you're in a you have, have something, or you're in a car accident with some, you have that bond with them that nobody else can really understand. So maybe there would be that. Yeah. What do you think, Sarah? I don't know. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, Denison? Is it Denison? Well, Margo was older than me. She was smarter. She was quieter. She was prettier. She was more grown up. She worked harder. And every time I did anything wrong at all, they would say, why can't you be like Margo? Has anybody had that experience with her? It can be pretty annoying. And, and um, she was sort of, sort of perfect. She studied really hard. hard. Even in, in the, the annex, she was learning physics and algebra and Latin and really enjoying it. 
and she never made anybody angry. So that, I think that was really what it was. I think, um, you know, at the very end of my life, there was just me and Margo, no one else. And obviously we relied really heavily on each other and we died within a day of each other. So we became very close. Um, and, she and she was a really good person. person. It was just, I think, she was annoyingly big sister good in the, in the early days. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and then Fossen? It's a great question. And um, I don't know if you guys said this, but um, we couldn't just the toilet that often where we were staying because the pipes ran right down through the factory. So it would be really obvious if the toilet was flushing from up above. So like people don't want to talk about that, but imagine being locked in a room with seven other people and, and eating, eating nothing, nothing but cabbage, cabbage for three days, and then, and then not being able to use the toilet except in the evening. I'll just, I'll just let, let your, your imagination take that away, away with you. Yeah. yeah. On, the On the plus side, side and because the, the factory that my dad, dad ran was a jam, jam factory, um, we sometimes, sometimes would get, get to help out with like making jam and, and stuff. So there was, so there was one, one day in 1944 in July where we just had mountains of strawberries. And it was like, it was like we hadn't seen fruit, fruit or vegetables for weeks. For weeks. Yeah. yeah. So, so there, there were some really good days. And I suppose we were really, really lucky in some ways. We ate better than pe some, some people did. But I think, I think it's really just about being locked in a small room. Yeah, and then beans and cabbage, not very good sometimes. Yeah. Um. David Stebbins and Jordan Fleming. What were you most afraid of during your stay in the secret annex? What was I was most afraid of? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, obviously, obviously getting, getting, caught, getting, getting found, found and, um, and, and getting, getting, you know, you know there were four, four people who knew we were there, there who were bringing us in food and magazines and things every day, and, um, I guess even worse than getting caught would be being the reason that those guys were caught and put in jail or killed. So that was probably what I was most afraid of. Yeah. So, so was, was that David, David and Gordon? Gordon? Uh, same, same question. Um, um, Joseph, Joseph Higginbotham. Describe what it was like not being able to go outside for more than two years. How did you uh, it, was it was just way, way beyond stir crazy and mad, mad and, and, and um, it was made, made a lot worse by. by not, not just only being, being in the same room, room just with your family. family. That would be really hard. But that could be like a, a camping holiday sometimes. sometimes. But this is worse than that because we were in close, close quarters with people we didn't know very well. And how did we keep our sanity? Try to laugh. No, I do. We would try and do funny things, put on plays, be silly, try and um, uh, cool down. And when I couldn't, when I was just going out of my head, I would write. So, so it's like a savior to me to be able to write in my journal. That's why, that's why when I ran out of room in that red checkered diary, I started writing in ledgers and anything I could find. Yeah. Um, this is a the difficult struggle. Uh, is it okay to skip my questions if it's really similar? I don't want to bore you guys. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to talk, talk about Okay, this was a really good question. Um, Kennedy, Kennedy Bell. Bell.
Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, it was the weirdest thing about it was that it was just a totally ordinary day. We were caught completely by surprise, and that's because someone called the police and tipped them off. There were Jews hiding um, in the attic of the building, and gave them the address. So we were totally surprised. Um, it, was it was a beautiful, beautiful sunny, warm, warm August day. day. It was about 10.30 in the morning. My, my, my father was upstairs helping Peter, Peter with his homework, and, and I was just studying my algebra. And the door just opened up, and Mr. Kugler entered. He had a pistol held to his head by um, an SS officer, and then there were four police officers that came in afterwards. And they said, get ready. Everyone has to be back here in five minutes with whatever you're bringing. Um, and then they started shaking out everything of our stuff or all the valuables. We had five minutes to pack what we could and come downstairs and they loaded us into a truck. And we were taken to prison and interrogated because they wanted to know if we um, knew where there were any other Jews hidden, but we didn't. We'd been in, a, in an attic for two years. Um, then we were transferred to a detention center. And then, and then by the, by the 2nd of September, September, so less than a month later, we were on our way to Auschwitz concentration camp. Yeah. Yeah. It just it happened really day. suddenly. Like a normal day, and then we're in jail. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Jillian Vance? Designed to find excuses to get rid of people, to work people. So, at the time we got off the train in Auschwitz, we were already made it past one selection. So, you get off the train, it's two in the morning, people are yelling at you, and they instantly separate the old people and the children, and they go straight to the gas chambers. They don't even get order. So, we were allowed to stay. So, we woke up at 4 4 in the morning. We had, had to raise and find, find our shoes. Hopefully, Hopefully nobody, nobody stole them because that's, that's like a death sentence. sentence. And, then and then we had to make our bed, our bed in a Betten bow, right? which is basically like a military style, style bed making system. system. And then, and then um, it, was it was nearly impossible because we didn't really have a proper bedding, and so it was just an excuse to be heated. And then we had to wash, we had to run out of the barrack and find the sanitary facility. There were, there were hundreds of people trying to get in there, and you only had a few minutes for washing. Um, and the guards beat the people who were the last ones to leave the, sand, the washing facility. And then we um, had breakfast, and that was, you had a mess tin in your hands. If you didn't have a tin, no food. And then the guard would give you 10 ounces of bread, some coffee, uh, which was, which was really, really tasteless, no milk or sugar, sugar. And, and then that would be, that would be the only um, solid, solid food, food that we would have for the day. The rest of it would just be some form, some form of soup. Um, sometimes, sometimes they would try and humiliate you on purpose. They would push you or drop your bread in the mud first or try and get you to spill your food so they could punish you for wasting food. And then, and then you had to line up in rows of 10. And that, and that would be a roll call, call, and that would last um, until, until every single prisoner, prisoner was accounted for. So there were thousands of them, so sometimes, so sometimes that would be hours if you standing still. All the prisoners had to be accounted for, even the dead ones, so they would drag the bodies out to go and be part of the roll call. And um, it would be in any kind of weather. So, so every day, all through winter, you'd be standing there in the cold or snowed on, and um, people would die of being sick from just ending that call, just getting catching the death. And then, um, then you had to find a work team, and you go with the SS and your guard, and, and you walk to, out to your yard. Sometimes you had to march to an orchestra. Um, they would, they would beat you if you did anything wrong. wrong. If, you're if you're lucky, you got a good tool, like a shovel or a pickaxe, because, because otherwise, otherwise you had to work with your hands. Often, often you would do jobs that didn't even have a purpose. Maybe, Maybe you would just have to move heavy rock around. around. So you might not even be building anything, but um, sometimes they were worse than that. Everything had to be done as fast as possible. It would be beating people who didn't do the right thing or who were too weak to work. Um, 
they would have a lunch break, and then they would get soup, soup, just in soup, maybe with potato peels, um, and then back to camp for an evening roll call, um, and then you'd receive dinner, some kind of soup that you got at lunch. You'd often the work, the work days were very hard, about 12 hours a day, and the conditions were very unsanitary. So um, when Anne when I died, I died of typhus, which is a disease that you get from ice. And so in, a, in, a, in, a, in a situation like that, crammed five people to a bunk, um, you're going to be catching diseases from other people quite easily. And that's really what made me and Mark so sick that we don't. Plus without medical care. But it's really the idea is to try and work you to death, unfortunately. So it was awful, obviously. And the trick there is they try to make stick you of your humanity so that people, people, the guards, and no one looks at you and thinks that you're a human. So they do that by shaving your head, um, by giving you a number, and then they never call you by your name ever again, and giving, stripping you of clothes, they take out your gold teeth if you had any gold teeth, and then just starve you. Yeah. So it was obviously terrible. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Nicole Steady. Just a moment. Oh, that's okay. Oh, that's okay. Or maybe, or maybe Ben Daly. I think it's the same. Oh, there she is. Um, throughout your diary, you expressed some undying hope for the future. Did you maintain that hope even when you were in a concentration camp? If so, how did you do it? I can definitely say honestly that there were some very despairing times. Um, and the good news is that Margot and I had each other until the very end, and we relied on each other. But the day in that life was so full of, um, of just trying to survive that my hope became about surviving as opposed to hoping to become a journalist or what I, was what I was going to do when I traveled the world. It was really, it became more and more about day-to-day -day survival, but I also really hoped to and clung to my humanity. I was absolutely committed to not letting it turn me into a different kind of person. I didn't let it um, induce me to steal from other prisoners or anything like that. So I kept my sense of self that way. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, Matt Brennan? Of all the miseries that you endured in concentration camps, what do you think was the most difficult? I think, I think for, for me, me um, honestly, honestly, it was that being, separated being separated from my father. From my father. We, were we were so close. So close. He, was he was my hero. hero. And, um, um, and, and, you know, support of the family, and it happened so suddenly, like, we just got to uh, Auschwitz, at 2 in the morning, they are yelling at us, and all the men went to one place, and all the women went to the other place, and I just never saw him again. And that was just heartbreaking, and didn't even get a chance to say goodbye or anything. Um, so that was really hard, and then just continuing to be separated from my family, I was um, with my mother and Margot. Um, um, for quite a while in Auschwitz, and then one day, one day we were chosen to go to the um, to the work camps, camps in Bergen-Belsen, and, and they just, they just took Margot away, and, away. and again we didn't get to say goodbye to our mother, and, and she died not very long after that. Yeah, so, yeah, so I think that was by far the hardest. Yeah. Um, uh, Monica, Monica Miguel. It's a good question. It's a really interesting question, Monica, because um, 
I did, I did uh, get to see a couple of people. Obviously, um, um, I was separated. I think I answered that. We separated from Peter and Mr. All, all, all of the uh, males, males straight away, straight away. Um, um, but we're the, in, Auschwitz, in Auschwitz found my old neighbor Rosa, and, and this is weirder. weirder. In Bergen, Belsen, um, I got to talk through a wall to one of my best friends from my neighborhood. Her name is uh, Hanley, and, and uh, she was like the person I miss so much. Um, she was the one I was really worried about that I left behind, and I never found out what happened to her. And we got to have a conversation. It was through a wall. She couldn't believe that I hadn't escaped to Switzerland. So it was really weird that I got to run into her again before I died. Yeah. Um, Um, Max, Max Feller. Feller. Um, well, after, after uh, we, were we were taken away, away the, the Nazis, Nazis came, came back and they stripped um, almost the whole annex, took, took everything, took the furniture, took, took everything, it was all gone. In, in fact, it was pretty amazing, amazing that we um, found, found my diary, diary and my journals at all. It was just one, it was just one of those things that got shaken out of my suitcase, suitcase. they snuck back in and found it before the Nazis came back and took everything out of the annex. So most things were gone. But, but um, when, Otto when, Otto was, my, when my dad returned in, in the, after, the after the war, war when you went, in, went there, in there, it was empty, and it was becoming a, a dilapidated, dilapidated building. building. But weirdly, but weirdly those, those, those um, photographs, photographs were still on the wall of, of um, not, just not just movie, movie stars, stars, but sports stars, and even just, and even just cool, like, like there were fashion and photographs, 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 photographs of children, and, you know, Women in, 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 in nice hats and dresses in the parks and things that I put on the wall, and those were all, those were all there. still there. Um, um, even, even little, little marks, marks where my dad, my dad had, had measured our height along the wall, along the wall while, we were, while we were there. They were all still there, and so, and so those are still there in the museum today. You can go and see them. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, and in fact um, that's, kind of, that's kind of a weird thing, but I, I, I think it really adds to the. Um, um, ambiance at the museum because when you go there, you really have a feel that you're in her in someone's bedroom. That you're not just in a museum anymore. It feels like um, you're in someone's room. So hopefully you can relate to that better. Yeah. Um, and we probably have time for one or two more questions. One more question. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. okay. Is there, somebody Is there somebody who I haven't mentioned, mentioned yet that's there, there that wants to ask that question? Anybody? Okay. Okay. This is an impromptu question, and that's not in the script. Okay. Uh, you described a typical day at, at Auschwitz. How was it like in Belsen? In Belsen. It's a good question. It was different, but. Um, so, so in Auschwitz, in Auschwitz it was an extermination camp, and millions, and millions of people died, died there. Belsen was designed to be a prisoner of war camp. It wasn't designed to exterminate um, the people that were there. So if you were originally early in the piece, if you went to Belsen, it was better. But by the end of 1944, um, Belsen went from having 7,500 people in it to 55,000 people. So all of a sudden, barracks would have Several, several hundred people sharing, just sharing, you know, you know basically not even being able to lie down together. So there was, so almost, there was almost no food, food the and the situation was atrocious. Was atrocious. It, was it was absolutely atrocious. Um, so, so it became, it became much, much, much worse. But just, but just when, when I was arriving, I was arriving at, that at that time, yeah, yeah. And, that's and that's probably why typhoid, typhoid was, so was so prevalent then, because, because, because the conditions were... were uh, uh, like way even way, even way worse than Auschwitz. Did that answer, Did that answer your, your question? Uh, I'll move it to uh, Sydney and Cassidy. Would you guys ask your question? In what ways do you think your narrative has changed our modern society today? 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, I, I, I think it put, it put a, a human, human face, face to a disaster. A disaster. Um, I think when you read about, about the Holocaust and you read the, and you numbers, read the numbers, you read 50,000 people died here and two million people died here. This, it's, it's, it's more than our minds can comprehend. But when, you, but when you, can you can read the story about what's happening to one person and really relate to them, it puts a, it puts human, a human face on a massive, a massive tragedy. Um, and, I'd um, and I'd like to think that it's increased the world's empathy toward people who suffered, who suffered in the concentration camps. Um, and maybe it will make us all a little more vigilant for the rise of fascists in our own society. Maybe. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much.